Hi, Vikas. Um, thanks for doing this interview with me today um, for the Emerald website. Um, Great. So, yeah. Uh, so, you're a, a Staglin Family Emerald Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at UCSF. Mm -hmm. um, what drew you to this position, and um, what do you like best about working at UCSF? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I am, and I feel really uh, lucky to be, you know, a, a Staglin Family and Emerald uh, Assistant Professor at UCSF. I mean, it's kind of always, you know, been what I wanted to do to be a scientist and, and have a lab and, and really study the brain and, and its relationship to these different illnesses. And uh, so that part is really exciting. And, and to have the opportunity that UCSF is especially exciting because it's a place that's always had fantastic, you know, neuroscience and brain research, um, but is also really unique in, in that within the Department of Psychiatry, there's a number of really great scientists who are working specifically on problems related to the biology that underlies psychiatric illness. And, uh, you know, I think the thing that makes uh, UCSF really able to take advantage of that, you know, strength in neuroscience and in psychiatry research is that it's, a, it's an incredibly collaborative place. And, you know, when um, I was looking uh, for positions and, and thinking about where I might start my lab, I found that everybody here was just incredibly helpful. People in other laboratories were thinking about ways that we could work together um, and, and kind of uh, have synergy that would uh, make all of our research better. And, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. And it's been really, um, uh, really great being here, and I've been able to take advantage of that. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, if I may ask, what got you started in, in neuroscience? Um, yeah, well, I think there's a few things that have always driven my interest in neuroscience. I mean, ever since I was young, I've always just been interested in, in systems and how they work together and how things right. that um, seem like they're made up of a lot of really simple pieces or governed by simple rules end up having right. really complicated behavior. And that's really what the nervous system and the brain is all about. You know, the nervous system is, yeah. is composed of individual cells, which at first glance seem relatively simple and, and they're interconnected, but uh -huh. um, they generate all kinds of really wild behaviors and just changing small things about the connections between cells or their interactions uh -huh. generates all new kinds of behavior. And, and that's really, I find, uh, just scientifically really exciting and interesting uh -huh. to try to understand how do you take that apart and understand how it works. Um, on another level, you know, and, and we've talked about this a little bit before, yeah. you know, that I'm just really interested in how the brain works and, and yeah. what it means to, to think and be conscious and perceive uh -huh. the world. And I mean, that's obviously at the center of our experience as people, both our, our everyday perceptual experiences, our thoughts, and also our emotional experiences and how we, uh -huh. why, why we see something, it makes us think certain thoughts and feel a certain way. And understanding how, again, like these individual cells and, and their communication gives rise to that experience is is I think just totally fascinating. That's awesome. Yeah. And it kind of dovetails with the next question that I wanted to ask you, th that being um, with your EMRO funded, your EMRO funded work at UCSF, um, uh, you've taken some very novel approaches kind of along the lines of what you're sort of starting to describe right. uh, to um, analyze different circuits and neurons in the brain and figure out um, why they might lead to symptoms of schizophrenia and thus, you know, be able to start looking into therapies for uh, mm -hmm. those abnormalities. Mm -hmm. um, can you please tell me a bit about that to kind of describe your, your, your studies with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I think I've been really lucky uh, to work at, at this time when lots of other scientists have, have spent, you know, decades really thinking about, you know, behavior and symptoms of, of diseases like schizophrenia. Um, and more recently, on the other end of the spectrum, people have identified genes, you know, that might be disrupted in schizophrenia. So I'm uh -huh. trying to work in the middle and think about circuits because, okay. you know, we know that something happens with genes that affect cells and the interactions between cells and that uh -huh. somehow changes the activity in circuits in the brain uh -huh. causing you know, symptoms and, and behaviors that are related to things like schizophrenia. Uh -huh. So I've been focused on trying to understand these circuits and um, it's kind of like, you know, if we had a map, right, of yeah. how these circuits work and how all the parts fit together, yeah. then if we knew that one part was broken, we could design detours to go around the broken part okay. and design new treatments. Uh -huh. So that's really what my, my work is trying to do and we focused on a couple of themes. Uh -huh. So one theme is looking at um, rhythms in the brain. So we've often heard about, you know, like the, the title of the segment, you know, brain waves, and, and there are waves in your brain, and, and your, there's rhythmic activity in your brain. So we've been trying to understand what is that rhythmic activity for, uh -huh. and how is it generated. Okay. And our idea is that in diseases like schizophrenia, the mechanisms that generate a lot of that rhythmic activity might be disrupted. And it generates activity that's 
out of sync, you know, or uh -huh. um, uh, not exactly at the right frequency, um, and that that gives rise to a lot of symptoms. And so if we can figure out, hey, how is that rhythmic activity generated, and how can we adjust it and, and get it back to the right frequency or the right level of synchronization, um, then we might be able to uh, correct some of the symptoms in schizophrenia. And yeah. the other uh, direction that my research is in is trying to, you know, um, take a lot of what we've learned over, over a long period of time about chemicals and neurotransmitters like dopamine that we know are somehow involved in schizophrenia, but again, look at circuits and, and figure out how those chemicals and neurotransmitters affect circuits in uh -huh. order to try to, to figure out, hey, uh, maybe if the level of dopamine is, is wrong or, or is having the wrong effects, uh, maybe there are other other knobs in these circuits that we can tweak to, to compensate uh, for those problems with dopamine. So those mm -hmm. are the sorts of uh, research we're doing, and, and I think, like I said, those will hopefully identify detours around broken pathways that will lead to, to new treatments for schizophrenia. Well, that seems like a very novel approach that your, your lab is taking there, so yeah. that's, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. it's, a, it's a really exciting time, and these tools are, are allowing lots of people to ask these sorts of questions that weren't possible to ask before. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll ask a pie in the sky question. Uh, what scale of research do you think it will take to find cures for schizophrenia mm -hmm. and, um, and other brain diseases? And given the opportunity, how, how would you go about doing right. that research? Well, um, let me answer that in two ways. And, and obviously, I'm, uh, you know, I'll defer. There's a lot of people who, you know, like Tom Insel, who runs the uh, National Institutes for Mental Health, uh, who think about this question constantly. And, um, I think have, have really uh, come up with thoughtful answers. But, um, you know, I think that one thing that, uh, that Dr. Insel likes to say is that, you know, when you look at uh, companies, right, and how they tackle really, really challenging problems, you know, uh -huh. however much they spend on, on solving a problem year in and year out, they usually devote a portion of their budget to research and development, right? Okay. And that R&D is usually something like 1% to 10% uh -huh. um, of, of what they're spending on, on actually dealing with the problem. And so if you think about how much uh -huh. a disease like schizophrenia costs, I was just looking this up. Um, in 2002, I think they estimated the cost of schizophrenia um, in the U.S. at something on the order of $60 billion a year, wow. you know, which is a yeah. huge number. Yeah. And you know, the National Institutes of Health and, and other federal you know, agencies spend a large amount of money on schizophrenia research, uh -huh. but it's nowhere near 1% to 10% of that. I think okay. um, the most recent number I saw was something like $300 million a year. Wow. So, yeah. um, so I think that if you want to think about the scale of what's needed, that sort of maybe gives a sense of, of where we're at and, and maybe what we should be aiming for. Um, now, if you think about uh, how to approach the problem, everybody has their own approach, but, but I really favor an integrated approach, like I was just saying, okay. where you're thinking about how do we connect genes to cells, to, to connections between yeah. cells, to circuits, to the behavior of brain regions, to behavior. And so in my lab, we focused on the middle part because, yeah. you know, obviously the middle helps you look at the, um, the other parts. And, and uh -huh. so we've looked at the behavior of circuits and we're doing some experiments where we try to understand, oh, okay, if we see this behavior of circuits, how can we relate that to what's happening with individual genes uh -huh. and individual cells? And uh -huh. also, uh -huh. can we do some behavioral experiments, usually in, in animals like mice, to yeah. try to understand, oh, if we see an abnormal pattern of circuit activity, how does that manifest in terms of behavior in mice? Does that produce behaviors that look like symptoms of schizophrenia? Uh -huh. And if so, can, can strategies that alleviate or rescue the abnormal circuit behavior also alleviate or rescue the, the abnormal behaviors in mice. So that's sort of the, the vertically integrated approach that we've taken in my lab. And I think that kind of approach on a much larger scale with a lot of communication between scientists yeah. at different levels is what's needed. Thank, thanks very much, Vikas, for your for, insight and for your time. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Brandon, yeah. for, I mean, we, you know, we don't get a chance to talk about this and, and, uh -huh. and talk about it with uh, the public very often, and so uh -huh. I, I really appreciate this opportunity and obviously everything that IMRO has done uh, to support our research. Absolutely. You're, you're very welcome. Thanks. All right. Thanks.